Well, good evening. It is uh, Wednesday afternoon, February 24th, uh, Wednesday evening, actually. And um, we are uh, still online on Wednesday nights. I uh, apologize for some confusion. We had a couple people contact me and ask if we were having service in-house tonight. And uh, I think I saw one pulling out of the parking lot a few minutes ago. Um, but uh, we... Uh, are still online on Wednesday nights, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is just limiting our gathering uh, for just a little bit longer, and then also uh, we've got some things to work out that we'll be talking about here very soon. Um, so please uh, let me know that you're there. Uh, let me know that, uh, that I need your feedback tonight with this lesson that um, if it's helpful or not, uh, because I'm going to be getting into some things that um, you may or may not even realize or um, uh, may not even want to know. So I, I need to kind of know by the end of our lesson tonight if you are enjoying and you're learning and you want to continue uh, where we are and, and the type of discussion that we're having this evening. Uh, so we want to keep praying for all of those that are battling COVID and for those that are um, worried about COVID and all of those things, we want to pray for those that are battling other sicknesses. There are other sicknesses out there besides COVID, uh, and we want to uh, keep all of those folks in prayer as well. Let's pray for our church family and that um, God would continue to move, continue to open doors continue to bless each of our family members. So before we get into our lesson tonight, I want to start with a word of prayer. If you would join me wherever you are. Uh, and again, make sure that you uh, comment, let me know that you're there and uh, that uh, tonight's lesson is helpful to you as we progress through it. But let's pray together first. Our Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for all of your blessings and for all of the wonderful things that you do for us. We thank you tonight, God, for your hand of mercy, uh, your hand of grace being extended to us, in that even when we are unlovable and uh, don't deserve anything that you do for us, Father, you still do it anyway. Uh, Father, we pray tonight, God, for those that are sick, those that are traveling, those that are working tonight, those that are uh, tired and weary, those that are struggling, uh, Father, that you would continue to bless them and that you would touch them you would show them how much they're blessed and loved, uh, and that uh, you would wrap your arms around them. Father, be our healer, be our provider, and all of those other things that you have provide, uh, that you have promised us, we claim those promises to be yes and amen in your name. Amen. Amen. I want you to uh, continue with me tonight on the uh, lesson of the book of Matthew. We began that a couple weeks ago. I'm going to try to stand still. I know I'm kind of close to you uh, in a different location tonight. I'm in my office uh, in front of my bookcases. Uh, you can see some of my uh, very old books. Let's see if I go that way. You can see the John Wesley journals back there. Uh, some of those books from the 1800s. Uh, I've got an electrical issue with uh, we've took down a light fixture and I have not yet put the new one up. And because of that, I just discovered uh, some more lights in other rooms down the hallway are off. So I'm in here tonight. Uh, so bear with me just a little bit. I'll try not to move back and forth and sway on you uh, to keep you from getting seasick. Uh, but as we began talking about the book of Matthew, we learned a lot last week about uh, Matthew and who he was uh, and um, began to get into some of the different statements that are found in the book of Matthew. Um, and I left you last week with an outline. And your um, notes from last week, if you printed that or if you pulled that up on your phone or whatever uh, from last week, now remember that I put the notes in the comments after we're finished with the lesson tonight. Uh, those notes included a an outline, and tonight's notes are going to include that as well. Uh, and I want to kind of go through that, and then we're going to hit some uh, questions that critics would, or, or some problems that critics have with the book of Matthew. And I'm not going to just leave you with what the critics say. I'm going to give you what scholars say as the solution 
to uh, some of the pieces that people are critical about, if that makes sense. And I hope it will by the time we're finished. Uh, the contents of the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew is the gospel of the king and his kingdom. Uh, so he is telling the story of his king, of this king, we know the king, uh, to be crowned is Jesus uh, and his kingdom. Uh, so uh, the, in the outline, we see a few main points presented uh, in the uh, person of the king. Uh, and in the person of the king, we learn that Jesus' ancestry is traced back, according to Matthew, uh, to King David, the descendant of Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. Uh, his advent, uh, his birth, features his mother, the Virgin Mary, and the Magi who come to worship in chapter 2. Then his ambassador, uh, John the Baptist, heralds the news that the king has come and that uh, everyone should uh, watch for him. Uh, we see Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist, and then uh, we see the preparation of the king. Now, the earthly preparation of the king is John baptizing him. And then what happens immediately after that is when Jesus goes into the wilderness uh, for his uh, fasting and then ultimately his temptation. Uh, and we see that is his um, period of preparation to be the king of the kingdom. Now, once the king is anointed and announced, he has uh, told Satan that he won't bow to him, he, won't, uh, he doesn't need him, uh, and he resists all of that temptation, then he is proclaimed, and he, begun, he begins to teach this mission uh, that mankind should repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 17. Now that begins to become his message, uh, his manifesto, if you will, uh, that his kingdom, uh, we find chapters 5 through 7, as he begins to discuss the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, following that, we see the methods of the king. He provides miracles. Uh, he provides signs to verify his sermon. Uh, the miracles follow him, and, and that confirms his message. And then we see that he chooses messengers. And as Jesus begins to choose messengers, they are for the purpose of spreading his propagation or telling his story, advertising the gospel and what Jesus has to uh, say to the rest of the world. So Jesus begins to select the people who would begin to proclaim the gospel story. Now, we hear a lot about the gospel today, and we hear a lot about proclaiming his message. Uh, but at this time, Jesus was training 12 people, 12 men, who were to become the disciples. That's what we know them as. They were to become those uh, messengers of the gospel who would spread the story from Jesus. Uh, now, we know that uh, only 11 of them made it to that point. And we know that they had their struggles because we find that throughout Scripture and even throughout the rest of the New Testament. The disciples were not on a pedestal. They were not heralded everywhere they went. They were not, uh, red carpets were not laid down for them. They were much like you and I. Uh, they were people who were, um, some of them were educated. Some of them were not greatly educated. They were skilled uh, they had jobs. Many of them had uh, spouses. They had homes. They had um, many things in life going on, but they still chose to follow after Jesus and to learn about him so that they could go on and, be, and continue telling the story. Now, as we continue to see through our outline, uh, Matthew presents the passion of the king as he prepares for what is coming. Uh, by uh, becoming the Passover lamb, ultimately, uh, we see him celebrating Passover uh, with his disciples and how to um, uh, follow after those Jewish customs that he was a part of. So in 
the passion of the king, we see that Jesus celebrated Passover. He ate with the disciples, eating the Passover lamb, if you will. And then uh, also the rejection of the Passover lamb being Jesus Christ by the Jewish people. We find that when Jesus was uh, somewhat, we, we call it his trial. It really wasn't a trial. It was, do you want this guy or do you want a criminal? Um, and they chose the criminal because they did not like uh, what Jesus had to say. He went against the grain of the tradition and the customs uh, that they had held on to for thousands of years at that point. Uh, it sounds much like the church today, doesn't it? That we've held on to our traditions and our customs now for thousands of years. Uh, and uh, many times our customs and traditions are based on um, doing now what my grandparents did or my uh, ancestors did more so than what uh, the Bible has to say about things. Uh, and that's a whole nother lesson. Uh, but I wanted just to kind of walk through a little bit of the outline of the book of Matthew with you. Uh, and that was in last week's notes, and it is the beginning of this week's notes as well. So the ultimate ending of the book of Matthew, as we get through uh, the passion of the king, the crucifixion, all of those pieces, then we begin to see the power of the king in Christ, um, not the crucifixion, but what happens afterward. And aren't you thankful that the crucifixion was not the end of it? Jesus didn't die on the cross and they just left him there. He didn't die on the cross and go to a borrowed tomb and just be left there. But rather, he was resurrected. And he resurrected, and in his resurrection, we see the power of our king on this earth coming into the light so that we can begin to understand just who this is in the name of Jesus Christ, right? So now, the next section that I want us to go into is looking at what how some critics respond to the book of Matthew. And I want to point out some things to you that uh, you may or may not have ever caught um, but it's where critics get hung up. And I want to give you not only the problem they have with it, but also the solution. So by the end of tonight, I want you to let me know if this is helpful to you. I'm only going to do a few of them. Uh, and then if it's helpful, we'll continue it next week. And I'll give you a few more before we move on to the book of Mark. Okay? So the first one we look at is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. Now, first chapter, you wouldn't think you'd, you know, you didn't, don't get very far before a critic has something to say, right? Uh, there are critics to everything, and we know that in life. Uh, many years ago, people would say, well, what, are the, what is there to be critical about with the Word of God? Uh, and probably for many of us, especially in the Bible Belt, uh, many of us who were raised in generations of people in church, you've heard my story, that I was uh, taken to church just a week or two old. Um, just uh, that was part of my life. It's always been part of my life. I wouldn't know what else to do on Sunday morning uh, other than get up and go to church. That's where I've spent my life. Um, but not everyone has had that experience. And now we are generations removed from that life uh, being passed down from generation to generation. So we see more and more uh, people falling away from church um, or never being introduced to it to start with. I think now we have generations that uh, in, into adulthood now that have never set foot inside a church. They don't know what church is all about. They don't understand what church is all about. So they're critical of the church and they're critical of us. And sometimes they have good reason to be so critical of us. Uh, but there were problems critics find with the book of Matthew, and that's where I want us to go now. So Matthew chapter 1, verse number 17. The first problem we see that from a critic's viewpoint is a question. Were there 13 or 14 generations listed between the captivity of Babylon and Christ? The problem is, Matthew says the generations from the captivity of Babylon uh, to Christ are 14. Now, 
He says that, but then when he lists names, he appears to only list 13. So a critic counted those, right? That's what critics do. He says that there are 14, but then he lists 13. So which is correct? Now there's your problem. Which is correct? He says there are 14. He lists 13. Which one's correct? Well, actually both. There are 14 generations that include someone living both before and after the captivity. Jeconiah is counted in both lists because he lived both before and after the captivity. So it, it's not necessary for us to um, see, we have to be careful, I should say. We have to be careful when we look at something and count, we have to understand what we're looking at. Because many times we find uh, the black and white doesn't always add up. However, it is not an error in the text at all. But we have to understand those uh, historical pieces to know exactly what is being talked about. So that was the first one. The next one. Matthew chapter four, uh, four, verse 14 through 16. The question is, or the problem that critics find with Matthew four, 14 through 16, is why does Matthew seem to incorrectly quote Isaiah? Now, the problem, it appears that Matthew does not quote Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2 accurately, or that he changed it. So let me grab my Bible here. Isaiah, I want to read these to you because I found this pretty interesting. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. Okay, that's what Isaiah says. Now, when we look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses four through 14 through 16, this is how Jesus says or quotes Isaiah, if you will, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, or Isaiah, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light to teach them which sat in the region and, sh and shadow of death light is sprung up. Now, it's, it's not necessary. If you were to say, Pastor David said this, but you didn't say it exactly the way I said it. You paraphrased it. You gave the meaning of what I said. It would still be perfectly acceptable to cite me as the one who said it as long as you portrayed the meaning behind it correctly. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was telling in a paraphrased version of what Isaiah had said, the meaning behind what he said. So it's not changed. Uh, it's not verbatim, but it doesn't mean that the scripture is incorrect or that Jesus quoted something wrong. We get in a viewpoint and in a mindset of thinking that quoting something, uh, when we see the New Testament, someone quoting from the Old Testament, they're not always quoting. It's actually paraphrasing what was said. And that's what we see Jesus doing here in Matthew chapter 4. So there's the second one. The next one, I like this one, Matthew chapter 8 verse 20. 
Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. The question, if Jesus was the Son of God, why did he call himself the Son of Man? It seems like a contradiction. It seems like um, some confusion, if you will. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. You can also see that in Matthew chapter 20, verse 18, and in 24, chapter thir or verse 30. The problem, Jesus referred to himself most often as the Son of Man and not the Son of God. So, the question from critics begins to say, if he calls himself the Son of Man, then is he denying his deity? Is he downplaying being the Son of God? And the answer is absolutely not. He's not downplaying or denying his deity whatsoever. The solution is this. Even if the phrase Son of Man is in reference to Jesus' humanity, it's not a denial of his deity. Jesus was not denying his deity at all. The phrase Son of Man emphasizes who Jesus is in relation to his incarnation and his work of salvation. So I began to look at this, and, and I got just a little bit excited because I was thinking this, and as I was praying and as I was looking at the scriptures and beginning to get a picture of what we're talking about here, the Bible says in Isaiah 43 and 25 that only God can forgive sins. Let me just pull that up. It says that only God can forgive forgive sins. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 25, I, even I, this is God speaking, am he that blotteth out the transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Now, that was God speaking, right? And then we go over to Mark, <laughs> watch this, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, verse number 7, and then verse number 10. Watch this. Verse number 7 says, Why do this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, we just read in the Old Testament that God said he is the one who forgives sins. But watch this. If we continue reading there, it says, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. Verse number 10 is key. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said that to the sick of the palsy. Huh. God, God our Father, is the one who blots out our transgression, transgressions and forgives our sin. But then Jesus said, I want you to know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Now, I started to get really excited here because I began to think Son of Man, Son of God, in the throne room of heaven, here's what I felt the Lord speak to me. In the throne room of heaven, he is the son of God. He is the son of God who is perfect. He is the son of God who had been in that throne room before creation. He is the son of God who assisted the father in creating everything that was created. And it was the son of God who took the stance to step away from the throne room and to come down and touch the earth. And when he came down and touched the earth, he became the son of man. <laughs> because now the son of God had left the throne room and come down to man's place. 
He became the Son of Man because He came to be our sacrifice. He came to be everything that you and I would need in life. He came to be the, re the, the replacement for our sins so that you and I could, could not have to die on that cross. He took that for us. So the Son of God left the throne room to come down to earth where you and I would live to become the Son of Man, to become the sacrifice for you and I. And now as the Son of Man, <laughs> being set free from the bonds of the earth, he goes back to heaven knowing what it is to be like man, to walk like you, to talk like you and I, to be hurt like you and I, to die on that cross and feel physical pain. He left this place with that experience known as the Son of Man to return to the throne room of God as the Son of God so that the Son of God now can make intercession for you and I because He understands where you and I have been. Wow. That excites me. It may not excite you, but it excited me to think about it in that light. That because now he has come to earth and become the son of man, he will return to heaven with greater understanding of his creation. Wow, that's good stuff. So the next problem that critics have with Matthew is Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34. And the question is, where were the demoniacs actually healed? If you know this story, uh, this story is where uh, some demon-possessed people came uh, to be healed of Jesus. The problem is, uh, some, looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a couple of them say, this was in the Gadarenes, the city of the Gadarenes, or the area of the Gadarenes, depending on what translation you're looking at. And some say it's the, the area of the Gerasenes, or the Gerasenes. What's the... The problem is there's two different places listed there. So, why is there a conflict? Well, again, there is not a conflict. Why is there something different? Well, most scholars chalk this up to scribal error. In those days, as they were transcribing these um, documents, these writings, oftentimes a scribe who was trained to sit and write what was being said would do just that. They would write what is being said. Now, the error is in how they described, it's really not an error, but how they described the area they were talking about. So for those of us, uh, here's, here's an example for you. When Melissa and I began dating, she uh, told me that she was from Beaver Dam, Kentucky. Okay, I didn't have a clue where Beaver Dam, Kentucky was, but that's where she's from. Had no other questions about that until later she talked about growing up in Eccles, Kentucky. Now, I didn't know where Eccles, Kentucky was either or how it related to Beaver Dam. She also talked about growing up in McHenry, Kentucky. Also, did not know where that was at. But then overall, she talked about living and growing up in Ohio County. So, my mother asked me one day as we were dating, and she had heard all of these different places mentioned as well. She said, where is Melissa actually from? She talks about Ohio County, but she talks about Beaver Dam and Eccles and McHenry and all of these places. So here's the answer. She's from all of those places. Because Beaver Dam is the city, if you will, and Ohio County 
encompasses the rest. So if you think about those of us from Owensboro, uh, we, live, we may live in Owensboro, but we also live in Davis County. So when you look at the differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whether they're saying the demoniacs were in the Gadarenes or Gerasenes, it's because it was two different places in an expanded picture. One place was a smaller area. The next place was a bigger area. I hope that makes sense to you. As if to say, we're talking about someone from Owensboro, but also someone from Davis County, if, if that makes sense. I hope, that, I hope you understand that. So the Gadarenes and the Gerasenes, and it's different in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they're talking about the same event and the same people. Now, there's another problem that people pick at with this uh, passage of Scripture. Again, Matthew 8, verses 28 through 34, and that is how many demoniacs were actually healed. Matthew says there were two. Mark and Luke say there was one. So who's right? Who's telling the right story? Well, again, huh, there's a fundamental mathematical law. It says where there are two, there's always one. Where there are two, there's always one. So you may say, think of it this way. If you had two friends, well, one friend and another person, let's put it that way, who won some great award, and the one person, your friend, you know personally, another person won an award, the same award, for the same kind of accomplishments, but when you went to tell the story, you told about your friend winning that award. It didn't matter to you that the other person was affected as well. We often say that my friend won the award. My friend received healing. 10,000 people may be healed, but if it's someone you know personally, that's the only person that really matters. I hope that makes sense. That's kind of what was being talked about here. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew says there were two people that came to be healed that were demoniac. They were demon-possessed. Mark and Luke both say one person came. It's probably because they were either... Um, It, it was probably because they knew one of them. It was a more noticeable or prominent person uh, in that area at the time. So to them, it really only mattered that the one person they knew came to be healed. It didn't matter that two people came. Matthew had a more objective approach and said both of these guys came. And it was worthy of his discussion. Now, the next issue that critics pick at is one that I have done some looking and studying at myself because it kind of caused me to wonder when I really stopped and thought about it. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 40. You can also find this in John chapter 19 and 14. Here's the question. If Jesus was crucified on Friday... How could he have been in the grave three days and three nights? The problem is that Christ rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. Matthew 28, 1. But he stated that he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So how do you fix that? We often, we, we celebrate, it's in our calendar. We celebrate Good Friday as the day that he was crucified. And then he arose on Sunday morning. That is two days, isn't it? Something like that. Well, 
there's a couple of different ways to look at this. One, some scholars believe that, G, uh, that, that Jesus was in the grave three full days and nights, 72 hours, which would put him being crucified actually on Wednesday. Some people believe that. And they believe that as a literal understanding. It's a, it's a focus on a literal understanding. Three days, three nights, if he arose on Sunday morning, he had to have been crucified on Wednesday. Now, others, and this is most biblical scholars, and what we already celebrate, that Jesus was crucified on Friday, and that the phrase three days and nights was a Hebrew figure of speech, if you will. Um, here's the reason they say that. The phrase day and night, here's the argument for the, this position. The, the phrase day and night does not necessarily mean a complete 24-hour period. Think of this, Psalm 1 and 2. The psalmist referenced meditating day and night on God's Word. It does not literally mean that you do nothing for a 24-hour period, but meditate on God's Word. Does that make sense? I hope it does. It's also found in Esther 4 and 6, three days and three nights does not necessarily mean 72 hours when they were fasting. If it began on a Friday, then the third day would be Sunday. It doesn't necessarily mean the 24-hour period, but the third day of living, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So three days and nights can be understood to mean within three days and nights. This idea fits the celebration that, we, uh, uh, that occurs every year in Christianity. It fits with the basic timeline uh, without question. And it gives us the ability to understand some of the other things that uh, we understand Passion Week, so to speak, the events of the week to fall into place properly. So, there's a couple more I want to do tonight. The next one. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 16. Why does Peter's confession here differ from that recorded in Mark and Luke? You can find that in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, and in Luke chapter 9, verse 20. Here's the problem. Matthew says Peter's confession, when Jesus is asking, who do you say that I am? Matthew says that Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Mark records it that Peter responded with, you are the Christ. Luke records it a little differently yet by saying that Peter responded with the Christ of God. Now the solution to that is actually several different reasons that this could be. The first one is that Peter probably spoke Aramaic and the Gospels were written in Greek. Now, if you don't know the difference between the translation here, when you go from one language to another, oftentimes there are not words that fit properly. So it's up to the translator to make the best fit of the words being shared. I hope that makes sense. When we look at the original text of the Bible and we look at what was translated in 1611 by the, the group that King James put together, there were many words that did not fit within the English language. Uh, so as they made the best fit they could at that time, 
we find multiple words being used in the English as one word. In the Greek or the Hebrew, it may be different words, but they're just clumped together as one. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, another reason that it could be, the gospel writers sometimes paraphrased. When they said Jesus said this or Peter said this, it wasn't like they were standing there with a recorder to record what he was saying and then to write it down properly. Remember, all of the Gospels, all of the writings of the New Testament were written after Jesus had died based on what they could remember. So their memories could have been slightly different and their paraphrase may have been slightly different. So the Bible, the Gospels are not contradicting one another, and it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It is based on their personal experience. So when we are looking at even a conversation among us as believers, um, we may have three or four people sitting in a room saying, hearing one story, and as each of the three or four people leave that room and go tell the story that they heard, it may come out differently. And that's what we see taking place more often than not in the Gospels. They are synoptic, which means that they're similar, they're pretty close to the same, uh, but they are not exact, okay? Now, the last one that I want to go over with you is Matthew chapter twenty. Verses 29 through 34. The question is, <clears throat> did Jesus heal two blind men or just one? We also can look at Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52, and Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Matthew, here's the problem. Matthew says there were two blind men healed, Mark and Luke both say one man healed. Now this falls back to the same mathematical law that we discussed a few minutes ago with the demoniacs. Where there are two, there is always one. It probably boils down to the fact that they knew someone who had been healed. Uh, Matthew says there were two the other two say there was one. It does not mean that it doesn't say only one. Uh, it may have just been that they may not have um, known the other guy. So it wasn't as impactful to them. The fact that Mark mentions the name of one blind man as Bartimaeus and his father, Timaeus, indicates that Mark is centering on one who was personally known to him. If two men were to receive a medal of honor from the president, like I was saying earlier, and one was your friend, it would be understandable that you would relate the story. You might speak only of your friend who received the medal. So, did he heal one or two? We don't know for a fact. Matthew says there were two. We trust that there probably were two. Uh, one was probably just more important to Mark and Luke as they were telling the story. Uh, it may have just been because there was a name involved with one. And by the time Luke got the story, after not being there himself, uh, it, it may have been the story as he was told, as he was writing his um, dialogue of what was taking place. So now, the last question I have on my notes for tonight is, is this helpful? There are more contradictory uh, things that critics look at that are not really contradictions, but uh, there are more verses of Scripture. And if you've enjoyed this, then please comment. Let me know. We'll continue this next week and finish up that way in the book of Matthew with the problems and solutions uh, for some more key areas before moving on to the book of Mark. If this is not helpful to you, it's not teaching you, 
then let me know. We'll move on to the book of Mark and begin that next, next Wednesday night. So please, again, comment, let me know, and I'll put the uh, notes in the comments just in a few minutes. Again, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, thank you for your giving. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for your worship and your relationship with Jesus Christ. All of us have the uh, potential to make a great impact in this world if we just live out our relationship in front of others. So tonight, let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, and we praise you for every opportunity. We thank you tonight, Lord, for being able to learn from your word, to be able to uh, study and understand what your word is trying to tell us, uh, and to be able to learn how to defend your word. We know that you don't need defense, but in this world, we face critics from time to time, and we need to know how to handle them as they come our way. So, Father, we praise you. We thank you tonight for everything you do for us. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep us all safe until we can join together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See you soon.